Boom. And we're live. Welcome, Eli. Hey, what's up, buddy? Nothing much, man. So, uh, me and Eli met, what, two years ago now, probably, yeah. right? Over at uh, the Roosevelt. Great conversation. That was honestly one of the best conversations I've had when I met someone, like, the first yeah. time. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, man. We talked about supplements, crazy supplements, <laughs> nutrition yeah. stuff, marketing, fitness, business, everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. We went into the Dispenza meditations a little bit. Um, yeah. Actually, you know, yeah. Yeah, man. That's um he's that's the top audiobook that I'm listening to right now. Triggers an automatic behavior. Awesome. Hell yeah. Which Great. one? Oh you break. Know how to be in yourself. And there's a there's an I will send you it's like a two hour YouTube video of him in Mexico. Unbelievable. Really? Yeah. Awesome. Hell yeah. Um so Eli. You've had one of the most interesting stories when I started to listen to the beginning, the middle, and now where you are. I'm not saying the end because it's, not yeah. <laughs> it's still probably pretty close to the middle. Um, it's it's simp- I mean, it's one of those stories that like goes up and down. So uh, if you want to, let's start with uh, Maryland, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I grew up in Maryland. Little, uh, little kind of small town not a whole lot going on not too fun didn't really fit in and um yeah just I I always knew it wasn't a place for me and I remember I I can remember specifically one time this just popped in my mind you ever seen that movie swingers yeah yeah Uh, it's like I remember I just wasn't very happy one day and I I'd gotten out of relationship and so was the the main character and he was in California and you know, he was depressed and drinking orange juice and his friend comes over. He says, man, you haven't left the house. And he's like, how can you be depressed here? Sun shines every day, beautiful women everywhere, palm trees, beach. How can you be depressed? And I thought to myself, man, if I live in California, I would never be depressed. Yeah. And I kind of planted a seed that I, I wanted to get out of there. And uh, some miracles happened and I got to go to school. Um, I think, I think, you know, my mom won the lottery. Um, yeah. just, just all these miracles started to happen. And I met some really great people, key moments in my life. And, um, and that's continued to happen. Even like this week, I'm uh, just, I'm attracting like the best people in the world. And is- uh, yeah, so it's been really good. I've been really blessed um, in, a, in a good state that I guess has been, uh, created some of that, the, the people coming up in life, but also some bad people. Not that, you know, I'm this magnet for all amazing things, but mm-hmm. looking back on it, and I think something that all successful people do at some point in their life, whether it's successful in business accounting, marketing, relationships, people that get to a certain point of success, they've, they've modeled the patterns of others. Mm-hmm. And then they get to a point and they were like, well, what was it that made that successful? So they can duplicate their own mm. system of process. Even when you see a great basketball player, maybe they, they bounce the ball twice, lick their lips, bounce the ball twice. They, they do like it's a routine that puts them to a state. And, you know, I've been very fortunate working with some amazing people and creating a lot in my life where I've looked back over the, the years and like, what was I thinking? What was I feeling? What was, what was I doing that created these systems? When you work with somebody like in fitness, mm-hmm. they get in the base of their shape of their life and they keep a, keep a food journal. They can see their water intake, their food, their carbs, their protein. So it's trackable. And in success, we say that it's called pattern recognition. Yeah. And if you work in the CIA or if you're an accountant or whatever, you start to recognize different patterns. Even a musician, you recognize there's patterns. And what I've gotten really good at and it's been my, my art has been studying the patterns in human behavior and starting with myself. Totally. Like, why the freak did I do that? Mm-hmm. Why did I say that? How did I mess that up? So I don't repeat certain pattern, patterns because history tends to repeat itself. But then how do I recreate the patterns of thought, feeling, and emotion to produce certain states in myself or others that produce desirable outcomes, be it in okay. sales or business or relationship or dating or whatever? How do I, how do I find that, that and... Uh, that's, that's served me well. So that's, that's kind of, I think, the, the thing starting in Maryland. I wasn't aware of a lot, of a lot of these patterns, and I experienced a lot of challenges. But I started studying my own mess-ups, but also the success patterns of other people, how they would walk into a room, their eye contact, their voice, the, the intangibles that make a person or any human being successful. And I wanted to model those and recreate those and then add to it. And so that's my whole, my whole kind of jam has been all about that for the last – 20 some years now. Awesome. Wow. So, I mean, that unpacks a lot. High leverage skill that I always talk about is pattern recognition, but the self introspection I think is uh, so crucial. And so many people don't realize 
the ability to both replicate successful people stuff by, I mean, most successful people have that self introspective element, but mm-hmm. also the ability to make sure that what you're doing is intentional. And I think you're one of the most intentional actors, not actors, but someone who acts intentionally in yeah. most, um, most situations, most things that you do that I've seen in a long time. I know, uh, the people that you meet, the things that you're doing, what you're eating, the supplements you're taking, it's all intentional versus the person who's like, I don't know, I just did this because, or um, I heard on a podcast recently, you were saying it's, uh, it's the stuff, these little things that we do and we're like, well, it's not really going to affect me. And yeah. that's the thing that ends up, of course, compounding and eventually affecting you. Yeah. Yeah. Wayne Dyer wrote a great book, The Power of Intention, mm-hmm. you know, just all on that. And it's, you know, it's like, it's just these little things that seem like semantics, like the, even if somebody's working out, you get, it's the difference between nutrition and diet or exercise and training exercise. People exercise to look good, mm-hmm. which is, you know, a reflection of how people see, see them. Um, and they're exercising to look good or to feel good, but training, like you train for, you know, like a sport, you train yeah. with an outcome you're training for something and to be successful as an entrepreneur, you need to be training your mind, your emotions, your body for life. So you're training for an outcome as opposed to just being on the treadmill of life. Yeah. So the intention is like, I'm doing this for a purpose and an intent. Um, even nutrition, there's like, you know, diet, your diet plan, which is kind of like limiting and restrictive, but a nutrition plan, you're like fueling yourself for the intention of being mm-hmm. optimal and productive and effective to be your best. So it's the intentionality that really, separates those people that are really producing something they're working towards something instead of just going through the motions totally so people aren't really clear on their intentions and you know going back to the process or what you would say would be kind of like a formula or a system that people could understand that relates to this is drawing from our own experiences and learning mm-hmm. and figuring out what's there And then how do we maximize on it? And so for myself as a content creator, a coach, a marketer, somebody who teaches content for the benefit of others, Mm -hmm. we can learn from the success and mistakes and and failures of others and, you know, and, or the patterns of others. But eventually it's about us taking our own IP, our own intellectual property, our own unique branded system, you know, our system and process, the steps we went through to get in shape to create our own business, to make our money, to influence others. And we create that. And, and then we share that with the world. That's our IP. That's our brand. And that's what makes us valuable to the marketplace. And so when we have any experience, and I've had a lot of experiences, we need to realize this. And you've heard this before from all the self-development work is that nothing has any meaning except for the meaning that we get it. Yeah. So human beings are meaning making machines. And what we, what we have to understand is that all events in themselves are neutral. Yeah. And people that have a really bad experience and they take that experience and they're able to learn from it and create a company or a product or some system that changes the world because they had such an emotional experience. Somebody else could have the same experience and they decide to like shoot people or eat ice cream and masturbate all day. Or, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and do nothing and, you know, live off the government or whatever. And yeah. make and roll. Same experience, different meaning, different trajectory, just different actions, different destinies. And so that comes from, first, we need to realize that all of our experiences are neutral, even the most negative ones. And so make it just seem like that's what it is. So energetically, and I know that you've studied um, power versus force. Totally. Yeah. And you know, that, that energetic scale from shame and guilt and anger to courage to love and peace and joy, you know, at the highest level, to have that, that level of emotion where we're at peace with what's happened. When we feel like, wow, there was some learning here. I love the fact that this happened. Easier said than done. And so it might not be this massively positive thing, mm-hmm. but it can't be this positively, this crazy negative thing. And so if we just see events as neutral, even if they've been challenging to us, we ask the question, what really happened? Totally. I wanted this and this happened. Not like this person lied to me, they stabbed me in the back. You know, this whole like emotional thing. It's like, what really happened? Well, I, I had some needs that, that weren't met. Or I thought the person was going to do this, and they, they decided to do something else. Because they, you know, and I didn't, I yeah. didn't read it. 
And so here's what actually happened. You know, it's, uh, I, and it could be something crazy, like, you know, people lose their legs in, in war and it's not their fault they had to go to war and all that. But some people, you know, release that trauma and some people decide to make it define them. And so we have to see events as neutral, not just for, for others, but for ourselves to release that, to forgive mm -hmm. and release that, and like what actually happened. To see it as a neutral event is always step one. I got broken up with, you know, this didn't work out. I invested my money. I got a learning experience. So the first step is always what actually happened, the facts, not the story. Mm -hmm. And then the second step is what did I learn? And so totally. when you do something and have the learning, a positive learning though. Not, I can never trust again. Not, I'll never invest again. You know, all people are stupid. I hate, you know, this race of people. Or, you know, you can't ever try a diet product again. No, no it's like, what's the learning here? Well, I learned that that didn't work and I need to try something else. So what's the learning? And so even the most negative experience, we can make it neutral. And then we can say, what's the positive learning? The positive learning. And then once we get the positive learning from the experience, I mean, that's the genesis of everybody who's ever created everything. They got some kind of positive yeah. learning. And then the third step a lot of people miss is this. It's how do I integrate the learning? How do I integrate yeah. the learning? And so that relates back to what you said about pattern recognition. How do I integrate the learning? So that I know that when I ask this or I text the person mm -hmm. and they take two days to reply back, maybe that's a, maybe that's a sign. Yeah. You know, I do this and I ask this question and they don't say yes or ask for a close and a sale and I get all weird. How do I not be weird? How do I make it mean something else? So, you know, how do I integrate the learning into a systemized process or routine or a recon recognition of a new pattern that I can integrate into my process, be it in my sales or my fitness or my business mm -hmm. or my dating? How do I integrate the learning? And then, the fourth part, so it's basically like you have an event that's zero. What actually happened? Yeah. Make it zero. What did I learn? Plus one. And then how do I integrate the learning? It's like another plus one. Mm -hmm. So now we're taking this negative experience and we made it plus two. And then the fourth step is where we can generate power and presence that will in, impact our influence and income where we can have anything we want. And so the fourth step is how do I share the learning? Yeah. And each person you share it with is a plus one. So I'm sure I could share some of my learning with you. Mm -hmm. And that would be like, you know, I talk about this event. I'm not all emotional and freaked out. Like, Oh, dude, dude. like this victim, <laughs> which is repulsive. I say, what happened? Here's the story. Here's what I learned. Here's how I integrated it. And you're learning too how you can integrate it. So it's yeah. plus one, plus one. So now I'm plus two and I share it with you. And that's like a plus three. So now it's a positive experience. And for each person you share it with, or each person that watches this podcast is like plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. And you know, Zig Ziglar says, if you, Help enough people get what they want, yep. you get what you want, and it's an energetic exchange. It's a universal law that when we put what we put out, we tend to get back. Exactly. If we negativity, if we put out lessons and positivity, it comes back, especially in this industry, financially, it mm -hmm. comes back to us in the sense of our growth and our ability to contribute. And we consistently contribute beyond ourselves in a way that actually matters to other human beings and makes our lives better. Well, then we get to have this awesome feeling that money can't buy. And that feeling is that our lives actually matter, that we matter, sure. that our challenge and our pain and our process, it was for a positive reason. And we affect the lives of other people. We feel like, wow, because I lived, I made a positive impact and my life actually means something. I'm a person of value. And that's ultimately where confidence comes from. Wow. Putting ourselves in the line, stepping up for other human beings in times of great challenge. It's leaders who step up. They've got this internal state of certainty that translates into their confidence and their competence. And they're able to affect other people and they feel so empowered, not from a state of ego, but it's a sense of pride. And that's where pride should come from. Not because you have the fanciest car or the biggest bank account. It's because you positively impact the lives of other people. And when you can do that. There's a different resonance than a person's voice, like a, a Nelson Mandela or a, mm -hmm. a or whatever. It's a sense of, of certainty, like, like I'm here for you. And I'm so certain that I'm here to make a positive difference in the world. And the life, life supports people like that. Yeah. It's a fascinating energetic exchange that we have. Yeah. I mean, you like quite literally just broke down the law of attraction. Yeah. Yeah. In Which, a way that's not too woo-woo. Exactly. And that's, I, I try to always explain that to uh, people who don't necessarily believe it. I'm like, well, thought is energy. Okay. Yeah. So if you just increase this ripple effect of micro habits over and over again, then of course everything changes to become you because you are 
based on your habits, the profile yeah. and makeup of what you do every day is what gets created in your life. Yeah. So it's the law of attraction plus uh, the law of traction because we actually have to do stuff mm -hmm. that we can you know, attract. We have to produce and have the conversation, say the difficult thing, create the company, all of that. But if it comes from inspired, inspired action, mm -hmm. you know, leads us to the traction in our business and our life, it comes from inspired thoughts that we condition over and over again, just like conditioning our posture, which is largely unconscious. You could talk about conditioning your muscles through exercise, mm -hmm. but our posture is largely unconscious. Our breathing, deep breathing, shallow breathing, emotions affect that. And so how do we get into this unconscious processes? That's a lot of what you studied in the Joe Dispenza work. Yeah. 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 yeah actually, um, I just was talking to uh, Patrick uh, McOwen of the Oxygen Advantage. And his was a lot of consciously um, making sure to nasal breathe, making sure to increase carbon dioxide through that. And then, of course, you're always doing it from then on. Yeah. But yeah. yes, conscious intention. I always say if your actions aren't mirroring your intentions that, you know, you're in, you're lying to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh incongruent. Yeah. Most people there, their, their words are here, but their actions are here. Their thoughts are scattered and emotionally all over the place. So when somebody's words, actions, thoughts, feelings, identity, belief system, all in alignment, there's a different level of power. It's like an antenna energy coming through you. That really allows your your intentions to land where it's not fractionated, and totally. so that that's got to be something that's consistently reviewed and conditioned and strengthened and expanded the breadth and the depth of our influence within ourselves. Um, level one, then to one person, then to a group of people, and then throughout time and space. Awesome. Um, yeah. That's yeah. It. So you go from Maryland, you're learning all this, you're breaking down how successful people act, internalizing building yourself up, Colorado, you were living in a tent for a yeah. while. Yeah. And what was happening there? You know, I, I ended up, when I was finishing up school, University of Maryland, I was working downtown Washington, D.C., and I met this, this beautiful girl that I was obsessed with for months. And uh, she was the youngest person to ever work in the White House, worked for Clinton. At her, she had a really high up position, yeah. pretty famous. I graduated uh, college and high school early, was valedictorian of both and was in Time Magazine traveling the world with you know, the president and stuff. And, um, and she was a red skinhead. So she like danced. So she was like a, like a professional dancer as well. So she's like a supermodel girl that's super smart with a great personality. And um, we ended up dating for about almost four years. And um, she's a bit older than me and really successful. And I looked up to her so much and she saw so much in me that I didn't see in myself. It really inspired me to be, to be better. And because me, my, my mom didn't grow up very wealthy, um, I didn't plan on going to college at all. But, you know, she won the lottery, which allowed us to, you know, have these opportunities to happen. And I, I felt really out of place. I didn't feel like I belonged in school. And it wasn't until I met Erica, I was like, wow, this is, I was supposed to meet this person. It just felt really right. And mm -hmm. we did it for a while. And after the Clinton administration, she moved out to here to LA, to Venice Beach to go to UCLA law school. And I ended up moving to Colorado with some friends. And, um, you know, I just kind of had one of those moments where I was going to stay in Maryland, but my friends had gone to Colorado and she was gone and I just felt really lost. And it was a, it was a line from a movie that I was watching at like six in the morning mm -hmm. after work as a bar back that inspired me to leave. Um, this from, a, you, you ever seen the movie, uh, Shawshank Redemption? Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's, I remember I, I would get home from the bar. I was like bar back, so I'm mopping the floors, bars close at 4 a.m. I get out of there at 5, get home, it's like 5.30. I start watching some of that movie, you know, and it's like 6.30 in the morning and I'm just wired from, you know, being up all night and drinking energy drinks and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, is this the life that I want? And I was making like two to $300 a night, which I was 21 years old, which is like good money. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, I'm rich, you know, and uh, feeling good about it. But I just felt really like kind of alone. And I remember I was watching that movie and uh, that line comes on after Andy Dufresne, Tim, Tim Robbins' character, has escaped from jail. And Morgan Freeman, the character Red, mm -hmm. is talking about how much he misses his friend. And it's very symbol symbolic because he's raking up leaves in a, in a graveyard, talking about time passing and the seasons of life and, you know, just and how we, we evolve. And he said how much he missed his friend. But then he said, but some birds just can't be caged. Their feathers are just too bright. 
And I was like, that's me. That's <laughs> me. And, and so I ended up writing a note to all my roommates and I told them to give away my stuff to the, my stuff to the Salvation Army or sell it, stare, like everything. And, um, and uh, I hit stop on the VCR, wrote a note to my mom or I called my mom and uh, said, I, I'm packing up all the stuff that'll fit in my car, going to Colorado, and I got just enough room for you. Uh -huh. with me and uh i told him to keep my deposit and all that stuff so the guys didn't mind that i was living with and um and yeah i went out there and i lived in a house with some friends for maybe like seven eight months and i got a job as a financial advisor hated it i was mainly doing it to impress this girl and i remember i came out here to visit her and we went to eat in marina del rey and this restaurant was like hurt a bunch of her law school friends very smart, and this is before smartphones, but they kept on using words that I didn't understand. And I kept on going to the bathroom, and I'd stop by the bar and grab napkins, and I would write the words down on the napkins that I didn't understand, and I felt really dumb. I felt out of place, and I wanted to be more than anything, to be, you know, more than to be rich or handsome or anything. I just wanted mm -hmm. to be smart. I wanted, it was really a, a big insecurity for me, so I started reading all these books when I got back to Colorado, and, um, you know, looking them up and had a really smart roommate at the time, Casey Bozon, who was uh, much, you know, he's really, really smart. So I'd ask him, like, what does this word mean? And what do they mean when they say this? And I started reading all the classics, like Catcher in the Rye, yeah. Old Man, and, you know, all these just the books that I never got to read in high school just because I didn't have the interest. And um, I, I went home to Maryland that Thanksgiving and um, a friend of mine was like, you know, basically suicidal. And I, I was like, we drank so much one night and he was talking crazy. And I woke up and I saw him sleeping on my my mom's couch and I knew it was the last time that I would see him if I left. So I woke him up and I said, flight takes off in a few hours, but I'm not going to go. Uh, instead, I'm, I'm kidnapping you and taking you with me. We're going to throw all your clothes in your truck and just, you're going to come and, and live with me. And I had, and I had this plan then. Um, the idea had already gotten to my mind. Um, I was quitting the financial advisor job and I was doing a bit of modeling, like promotional modeling, not like yeah. model stuff, like, Twenty thirty dollars an hour at a bar, handing out cigarettes and Guinness beers, and you know, not the, not yeah. the. It's funny if like you're on Tinder or Bumble or anything. I don't know if you've ever been. I don't know if you have ever been on one of these apps. I have. I have. Have you heard of them? There's like you. You see all these girls that are that are not bad looking, but they're you know good looking, wow. and, and they're like I'm a model, and it's like uh, you do promotion <laughs> modeling. <you> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like and you know yeah, anyway it's um it's just funny some people's ego but i had no ego about it i was more insecure about it they actually wanted me to do some pretty big time modeling they just they liked me and they liked my look back then but i was like was pretty insecure and so i didn't go through that part but i did the the promotional stuff and i just got the the idea that i would do that get rid of all my bills and live in a tent and so when i took my friend back um i kidnapped him from maryland he lived in my place and I mean, all my stuff became his stuff and um once he got settled and it got a bit warm because that was mm -hmm. You know, like the summer, yeah. uh, you know, when I think it was like April, yeah, April, I moved into the tent. It was still pretty cold then. And there was a place, it was about 30 minutes outside of Boulder, Colorado. Okay. Down called Netherland, up in the mountains, down the canyon. Um, you've, have you been to Boulder or any of that? Yeah. I haven't been to Boulder, but I just lived in Denver for a month, actually. Okay. I yeah, did a month over there. Boulder's, man, it's, it's top party school in the world. It, and yeah. The magazine shut them down and said, we can't even rate you anymore. You're professional partiers. Really? Like, these colleges and amateur, you guys are professional partiers. Like, you, you guys have gone pro. They couldn't rate them. Them in West Virginia universities, like, we can't even rate you anymore. Too good. <laughs> it's like pretty mountain girls, you know, no makeup, just, just gorgeous, natural, totally. normal people. And uh, I ended up, uh, it, me and that girl broke up. And I, I ended up managing an Abercrombie and Fitch as well, right on Pearl Street. Um, and I had like, like 80 girls working for me and stuff. So it just, and I'd never really been single. I always had girlfriends. Yeah. I, I didn't, I told her I didn't want to break up with her, but I didn't want to cheat on her. So I, the best thing for me to do was to not be with her. Cause I never had that, that yeah. time. Like, how, how old are you? I'm 23. That's, that's exactly, you know, I was, I was, tw I was 22 living in the tent and then okay, I, yeah. I was 23 when I still lived in it. Man, it was, it was some good times. 22, 23. But yeah. man. You would love it in Boulder, you know? You oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was cool. And I ended up uh, just living out there. And it turned into like about eight months up there. 
And um, you know, like when it got crazy cold, uh, I noticed that I was much more, I was really shy mm -hmm. and I didn't talk to a lot of girls, but when it got really cold and I went out to a bar, I found my motivation went up to try to go home with a girl and not to the tent. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, so it was, uh, it was a good time. But yeah, I read a lot of books. I hiked a lot. I got to spend a lot of time in nature. Mm -hmm. And it was a good time for me. And uh, yeah, and then at the end of the year, I ended up moving here to California. Lived in my car for a bit till I got on my feet. And, uh, and I started to make some things happen. Man, that is... I haven't been to Boulder yet. I know Pearl Street, of course. Um, oh. But I definitely am going to go soon. I mean, they have the most sunlight, the most sunny days out of any place in the world. I guess like it's like 300 days a year. They have like a full sun. And then, you know, it's blue sky, big blue skies. So you'll have just the rain cloud that passes once in a while. Yeah. But it's that is awesome. But now you're out. Are you in Venice or are you in LA? Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills? Yeah, West Hollywood is like a couple blocks that way. Well, one block that way. Uh, Lewis House, you know who he is? Yeah, yeah. Like two blocks that way. So I'm oh, awesome. That, that kind of area. You know, which is, yeah. which is nice. It's a nice area, but I am going to move to Venice uh, at some point this year. This totally. Summer. The feeling of abundance. So yeah, a lot of what you've talked about is experiencing abundance versus the mm -hmm. negative aspect of scarcity, which I see is one of the hardest but biggest mindset switches that if people make, it can change everything. Do you think yeah. that part of that was the... This spark, I heard you say you believed in magic as soon as your mom won the lottery. You know, our, our beliefs, you know, people can try to change their beliefs by incantations and affirmations, and that, that can work. But the way that we change anything in our life is through repetition and intensity. And experiences are what shape our beliefs. And so we could have one painful negative experience and people forever is like, oh, that's, that's how life is or business is, or, you know, one positively powerful experience. Um, we make it mean something, you know, uh, some, if somebody won the lottery and believe that like they're entitled, they will lose that money. Totally. But if you become grateful and you know the power of gratitude and you're appreciative and you feel like you're blessed and you're here to share some blessing for the world, um, something happened for you and you feel a sense of responsibility to contribute beyond yourself, that, that meaning um, can create a different experience of life for yourself and others. And so the beliefs that I attached to that experience where it was, a very, it was intense and I didn't need a lot of repetition, ideally it would be nice to win the lottery many, many more. But I, I like more repetition. <laughs> um, but I, I'm not betting on that. I don't, I don't actually play the lottery. But, um, you know, intensity and repetition are how beliefs are created from our experiences. And those experiences, though, as you know, um, can be real or imagined. Totally. And it's that sense of certainty. A belief is a feeling of certainty. And so a belief can come not from what's real, but from the possibility of what's real and owning it. You know, Walt Disney has a great quote. Um, he says, most people say they need to see it in order to believe it mm -hmm. he says you need to believe it if you ever want to see it yes. and so it comes down to the the f word faith you know in ourself and like literally so much certainty in how things can be like even if it's not actually there but literally seeing it making it so real in your mind and when that opportunity shows up that conversation that prospect that person shows up it's the it's the confidence that's been conditioned through repetition and intensity of your own thoughts and feelings and emotions and your vision in your life you know and that's why those people are called visionaries yeah so, so we need to create that in our life and it's it's really powerful what we can create from that place so you went from thinking you were dumb to now a master wordsmith i guess so you know it's like i would... I, I hear when i listen to other people mm -hmm. i can hear their tone is a little off and I say the word like, um, you know, I don't do it that much because I'm conscious of it, but I still do it. And some of it is a bit conscious because if I'm too word perfect, mm -hmm. people can't relate to me. So if I'm 100% clear and articulate and the words land and da 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 yeah. da this flow and rhythm, which I can do, uh, people will do that and they let certain words land. And it's just, it's a bit contrived. Totally. So 
I try to be pretty loose with it and changing my tone. When you listen to Tony Robbins, he's got all this vocal tone. And he's got his voice and da, 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 and he's asking these questions. And as you begin to this, I mean, have you ever asked yourself? And he'll, he's asking all these questions to do things inside of your unconscious mind. And so I, yeah. I know that process, but if you're too good with it, people kind of tune you out. And so the, the thing for me, I, I wouldn't say I have uh, a extraordinary level of intelligence still. I have friends that are true geniuses and it's amazing mm -hmm. what they create, but out of our greatest pain can come our biggest, uh, you know, you totally. know the world because we focus on it. And so for me, listening to great speakers and when, when I got a hold of Tony stuff, I was like, I want to study everything this guy does. And I knew that it would, it would affect me or infect me in some way. Yeah. This would, would turn me into something bad or it would affect me in a way where I could be something good for myself and others. And so it, it, afford, it fortunately, it did both, but it, you know, it affected me in a good way where I was able to pick up on some of what he was doing unconsciously and, and very consciously at the same time too. I wanted to, to wordsmith and my vocabulary is not that big. I, I do want to work on my vocabulary even more. And yeah. here I st I've been reading a lot more instead of reading, just going through audiobooks like actually reading books that are complex and slowing down, articulating the words, finding out specifically what they mean, using them in sentences. So that, that whole process. And so I'm always trying to make it better, but it still surprises me when I hear people say that I'm, that I'm a good communicator. Yeah. I've worked on it so much, but I, I don't, cause I, I see the, the bar of how much better it can be. And so I'm attacking that in a healthy way where I'm not beating myself up obviously and not speaking to anybody because I still talk, mm -hmm. but I'm, out there doing it and I realized the potential where somebody else feels they have a feeling of lack and that they're so far away and so they take no action and that goes back to what I was saying the difference between competence mm -hmm. and confidence there's this competence confidence loop somebody says well you know I'll be confident once I'm competent mm -hmm. if you ask somebody are you confident you can tie your shoes you say yeah why because I've done it a million times and so because they've done it a million times, they're confident, they're competent, they can do it with ease, which allows them to be confident at it where they don't think about it. The challenge with that is if somebody needs to do something a million times or 10 times or 20 times before they actually feel confident, there's a lot of things they will never do. And so we need to get into a state of confidence and absolute certainty before we try something for the first time, before you approach the girl, before you start the business, you need to generate that state. Otherwise, if you're waiting to be competent, to do something a thousand times before you have a feeling, you'll never even start. And so we have to have, be confident in our abilities and the vision of what's possible, not competent, so that we can become confident because then that just takes too much time. And life is happening so fast today with media and information. And if you're going to be in it, if you're going to truly be in it in a relationship, in a business relationship, in anything in life is moving so fast, we need to be able to create and cultivate and generate that feeling within ourselves and then show up with absolute confidence and certainty and just know that we're competent just because we believe we are. Mm. Because we've done something a million times. Totally. So that, that's usually what I see stops people in business and the people that are really doing it right now, they're moving so fast. Gary Vaynerchuk has a camera on him all the time. Uh, Ty Lopez. A lot of people, a lot of people don't like Ty, but man, he is consistent with some freaking. Mm. And most of it's not even very good. It's him playing basketball and hanging out. It's lifestyle. I mean, it's not like it's not like this is life changing content, you know. And it's just, but he's so consistent. He's front of mind focused for so many people. Yeah. And uh, I spoke at his house at a mastermind, and he spoke right after me. The level of energy, and I was. I was, you know, clear in my intent and I was clear in this and I showed up powerfully and I wanted to affect the emotions of everybody there and ask these questions and I was engaging and I planned it out and I was so certain and I was so clear in the impact I want to have. Mm -hmm. And then after he spoke and he was just like, Hey, read this book the other day. And he just kind of rambled. Yeah. Like, oh. And uh, that's why I say people, if they, if they can have that level of competence and confidence that Ty has, but also do the work and show up, you can blow past a lot of people. Totally. Uh, you know, I did, I did an event with, uh, you know, Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did a one-day seminar in, in Norway, in Oslo, and I outsold him. There you and go. Like, he, I'd say he's a better salesman than me, but I spoke after, which was to my benefit, and I was more clear. He was there to deliver value and to teach, where I was there with a clear intention of how 
I was going to build upon what he did because I knew that his content would be great. And I wanted to make his content a piece of the bigger picture. Mm. Of what I was, I was teaching. So I, I, it's, it, I collapsed his frame. It's yeah. what we call it in, in NLP talk, but that, that process is just more advanced linguistic skills. But I tell people, if you can master that, recognize those patterns and be in it and show it with absolute certainty and have a real positive thing you want to do in the world, it's amazing how quickly success can come to you. Totally. So one funny thing that I have to mention is you were saying that you purposely will put in ums and uh, mm-hmm. the different. So did you watch the video of Google Duplex, uh, their new thing? No. So it's uh, going to be... Uh, like computers. Yeah, the assistant that will call for you. And yeah. it was purposely putting in ums and buts and, oh, okay, purposely. Yeah. Because you're correct. If we don't have that, people are like, eh, machine, don't listen. Yeah. It's very, in- it is interesting. So that mindset, so man, there's a lot that we could touch on. But with Tony Robbins, you became the top salesperson outselling even Tony, right? Well, Tony sold for Jim Rohn. Um, it, was, it was different then too. I mean, Tony, I mean, not to say that I was better than Tony, but Tony, mm-hmm. when he was doing it for Jim Rohn, it, he was going around, there was no email. I mean, he was knocking on doors and um, he would, you know, calling, there was no, pay, mm-hmm. using pay phones, had like a stack of quarters and calling people out of the phone book, trying to book meetings and stuff. And but he's a machine. Nobody, nobody is, there's nobody in the world that outworks Tony Robbins. Like I've seen him yeah. on stage for 15 hours straight on zero, where I know he slept zero hours the night before. And he's like that 275 days a year. I mean, he's, he's a machine. Like people have no idea what, yeah. what he has, does in a day. It's like, it's unbelievable. Um, but in his company, as far as selling tickets to his events, mm-hmm. um, and you know, he's, he's got a much bigger brand than Jim Rohn. Um, he's got the biggest brand in the business all time due to marketing and things like that. And just the amount of money that is sent, spent on personal education now way more than it was back oh, then. So it's, you know, like there's people now that are, you know, got digital courses and they're kind of comparing themselves to Tony Robbins. Mm-hmm. It was a different ball game back then. I mean, he did it. He, he was so good in his 20s that before he was 30, Princess Diana heard about this man, met him, and he coached her for eight years. You know, started coaching before the age of 30. Coached the president of the United States before the age of 30. No internet, no email, all word of mouth. Wow. Yeah, I mean, people, all the, all the people that are doing these brands and talking about millions now, and yeah, you can do it. You can be a 20-some-year-old kid and do it now, yeah. but nobody will ever do it at that level. I've never seen anybody... Yeah. I've never seen one percent as good as him, and I've seen the best. I mean, and now he's he's still growing. It's it's yeah. awesome to see. I mean, more and more you're seeing even the people who are saying they're like Tony Robbins. They're doing this. They're at his events. They're well, practicing he's, his he's steps. Old. He's he's fifty nine. Yeah. So he's you know it's he's he's doesn't have the energy that he did, but uh, yeah, and he's he's doing a lot. He's doing a lot, you know. But but the self development thing isn't his focus anymore. Yeah. Business. Yeah, exactly. So you have spent a ton of time in Bali taking a break, uh, experiencing. I know with uh, your business, you were traveling around. You said you moved constantly for like two or three years, barely ever was at your house. And then you took like eight months in Bali practicing yoga, meditation, mindfulness. What was that all about? Well, since 2005, uh, I would move to a different city every three, four months. So about for, for 10 years, live in a different city every, every few months. And I took some time off. So that's why I say 10, right around 10 years. I'd take like a few months off here and there because I just burnt out. I'd live in Miami. I'd live in Chicago. I'd live in New York. I'd live in Philly. I'd live in LA. I'd stay in Jose. So I'd move in these cities for a few months. And it's, it's, you know, you do like two, sometimes three seminars in a day. You know, I do like a morning one inside of a company. So I've done mm-hmm. thousands of seminars, literally. And you know, it gets really, really burned you out. The last cycle I was with Tony, I guess a year, last March, I left his company. We had an event here in LA and did really good. And I was so mm-hmm. burnt out, decided to go to, to Bali. I was laying around here um, and I'm not a big marijuana person, but I got some edibles and stuff like that. Yeah. One day. I, I went to this, this place. And they have this, this special where you could like buy one, get one. I basically, I got, I was like, just give me one of everything. I got $500 worth of <laughs> sprays, oils, you know, vapes, like everything. And I basically just like laid around for a few weeks. And I was like, I'm just going to lay around 
and just heal because I was so burnt out. I was well lay around in Bali. So I just went there, did yoga, meditated every day. It was awesome. And then uh, I came back here and started working a bit, but I took off most of last year. I did, I did some, some one day seminars, which, you know, I, if I do like one, one, se- one day seminar a month, I mean, I, I make five figures on it. So it's like, kind of supports me. So I've not been too motivated, had some money saved and, you know, I got my group coaching program and somebody will do a one-off session with me and we'll do like a one day or something. So I, I've made good money despite like I hardly work. Um, but now I'm like really ready to dial that in. I did just go to Bali. I guess I got back about a month ago. Um, yeah, actually exactly a month ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to Bali again. Actually, I was, I was, la- I was sitting here right, right here. Yeah. And I had this idea last year when I went from Bali, I want to go to China but I had a connecting flight in the Philippines and I didn't have a visa in China. So I had to stay in the Philippines. Uh, for a year. And have you ever seen that, that, that one minute video Nas daily? Have you seen those? No. So there's this guy that does one minute videos, one minute every day, really positive about, you know, this. And so he's just traveling the world, shooting these beautiful, amazing, positive, cool videos about different countries. Yeah. So this has been like, like well over a hundred countries and his favorite country in the world is the Philippines. And I remember when I heard that, I was like, I wonder why. But you go there, everybody speaks perfect English. They teach it in schools. Really? It's super cheap. The people are like so friendly. It has, when you Google the most beautiful beaches in the world, it's Palawan, El Nido, all in there, the most beautiful beaches. So I was sitting right here and I was like, mm-hmm. I've been thinking about going there for a year. So I was like, I booked my flight. I was on the plane six hours later. I nice. fly to Manila, stayed there a couple of days. Then I went to all these beaches and then I went to Bali. Um, and uh, was there for another, like another month. And awesome. so lots of yoga, lots of yoga. It's very, they say, they say that Ubud in the middle of uh, Bali, it's like the heart chakra of the world. Really? It's so healing. It's yeah. so nice. It's, uh, it's really special. So what kind of yoga are you doing? Whatever they have. There's a place called Yoga Barn. I get a, it's a, like a, the famous kind of yoga place. And whatever they have, usually some vinyasa flow, something like that. But I was doing a bit of kundalini. Yeah. Uh, since I got back, I've gotten into an ashtanga class. Okay. I'll do some of that. But uh, yeah, just this last week, I've been lifting weights again, which has been, it's been years since I have. But uh, I want to be looking like our boy Greg soon. Yeah. The 40-year-old version. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you're going to have some killer muscle memory, though. It's yeah. going to trigger. Just in the last week, my, my legs feel juicy. My back, yesterday I was just lifting heavy weights and I was like, this is awesome. Are yeah. you going to throw the hunky Santa costume back on and then do round two? I think, I think I'm going to retire that. I think I'm going to retire okay. that. You yeah. got to at least take the like before and after transformational picture. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. You know, this is already like when I did, when I was in Bali, just doing yoga every day and eating really healthy. Mm-hmm. I was like shredded. Like I had my eight pack back. And I was like, you know, my before pictures are never that uh, impressive for people. Yeah. And I, I could just like eat ice cream every day for a month, but yeah, <laughs> I probably not do that. And uh, so, yeah, I, I did this, uh, this event with a guy named Garrett J. White, mm-hmm. Wake Up Warrior. Yeah. Fashion. Um, good stuff, but not my style. Because um, it's really, it's a men's group kind of in your face, really like. Yeah, you know, totally. If you kind of step up, don't be, you know, like, a, you know, it's just really, it's very masculine, which, you know, not that I'm against that, yeah. not, not that I'm not a man, but it's just that, that thing is just, it's a bit much for me, but there's some core concepts around what he teaches that I integrate into my life. And we all do when we're most effective. So it's like his core four, it's part of the morning routine that relates around body, balance, being, and business body, nutrition, and training, mm-hmm. balance, making investments in your relationships, sending people notes, connecting with your family, mm-hmm. systematically doing that daily, and then being, meditation, and journaling, business, discovery, and declare. Discovery meaning that you read some new content, you learn something in this podcast, you discover something new, and we're all marketers these days. Um, everybody's a marketer. Even if you're working at a job, you're putting yourself out there. You have your own blog. You're remaining relevant in the marketplace based on what you're newly discovering, making sure that you're relevant because you're learning new concepts. And so you need to be relevant. But the way that you become an influencer of any kind is you need to declare. You need to take that new discovery of content, information, story, experience, make it mean something, take it through that process, learning, 
integration, sharing, and then that declaring of your knowledge makes you relevant in the marketplace, which makes you top of mind when people think of you on Facebook or whatever, and that's how you build your brand. So it's a systemized process that gets you in your body, makes you connected to your relationships and the people that you care about, gets you to work inside of your head, you know, meditation and journaling where you're working in instead of just working out, working in, connecting with yourself, and then discovering information with the outcome or the purpose or the intention of sharing it in a way where it can come back to you because all things do. And so mm -hmm. systems like that in your life are what really help business people grow. So I've got my own kind of version of that that I just kind of took you through, but it's yeah. a, little, a little bit more but Eli Wu Wu um, type thing, but that's where I got it from. But he he got it from a guy named Kevin Nations who teaches sales. I mean, it's uh, I think it's family, fitness, faith, and finances is what he okay. called his core so, four. And then you for a while were doing the seven figure body. Yeah, I did that as you know, I, one of my coaches, uh, Jesse Elder. You know, Jesse's he's really amazing. Um, I did this, he did a training for something called ethical cult building yeah. How do you build a following and, and I was I, in that. Oh yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I ended up doing a few days of training with him down in Austin and I was doing the personal the fitness training and stuff. And he says, why don't you just, why don't you just do this, this sales thing? And I was like, ah, you know, I, I don't know. He says, he says, you're the top person for Tony. He created an award in your name. He's like, and he really sold me on it. And I was like, and I, and I had some good concepts that were Tony stuff. And I said, you know, this, that, and he said, he's like, I'll help you. And he's, you can mm -hmm. kind of, he was teaching sales stuff, his own process. He was like, here's the framework. He's like, kind of just teach this and make it your own and stuff. And he just helped me out so much. And, uh, and I've definitely helped him a lot since, um, yeah. whenever he does, uh, kind of a sales video, he takes out his phone and he shows a testimonial for me and how he helped me. And he says that's made him hundreds of thousands of dollars. So awesome. You know, and I tell people, like people ask me how I became good, you know, close with Tony. Yeah. I've, I've made Tony a solid, you know, nine figures. I've made him a good hundred yeah. grand, a hundred million. <clears throat> I would make anybody a solid, you know, nine figures things to help your relationship. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would hope. Otherwise it's, you know, something else is going on there. Yeah. But so I've got great mentors. And people always ask me, like, how do you get awesome mentors? I'm like, well, make them lots of money. <laughs> yeah. Know? And, uh, and they, they will notice that. And they will, they will help you. And Tony's given me coaching that would have cost me millions. There was even a period, right, with Tony where um, you didn't have, where he gave you the option between uh, not getting paid, having a pay of, or a leave of absence with no pay. And you yeah. did choose the uh, go without pay but work harder to show him in order to get his trust, right? Yeah, well, basically, I did something that I should have been fired for. Uh, I was definitely in the wrong and, um, you know, it was interesting. They, we all hopped on a, a conference call, Tony and the, the company and everything. And they gave me these options. I could resign from the company. I could uh, um, take, I think it was like, it was three different options. Mm -hmm. One leave the company. Second was uh, to take basically like two weeks, um, like just off mm -hmm. and just, you know, like a suspension or work three weeks without pay. And, and all the money that I made would go to Feeding America, um, the charity that Tony used to feed uh, yeah. 100 million people a year now, which is amazing. People don't even talk about Crazy. that. Amazing. And uh, so I worked hard and he wanted to kind of test me to see that in those weeks that I was working, I wouldn't get pay. Would I sandbag all my meetings and tickets in a way where I could get paid on them later? Or would I still produce the numbers, generate the business, and work hard? And I, you know, and I still worked hard, and I produced even more those yeah. those weeks. And so, yeah, it's a, and he and he called me, and we talked about it. It's, it's always, I mean, I got Tony Sell. It's not like we hang out on weekends and yeah. still now and then. And you know, when I get a call or a text from Tony, it's it's kind of cool. You know, I'm I'm still a huge fan. You know, I'm, I'm probably his biggest fan. Totally. Um, one up so yeah i mean i i know some of his stuff like word for word i've listened to it so many times and they say if you're going to model somebody you model the best and uh he's still he's still the best totally um and so now you're even when it comes to mentors you're working with a master hypnotist right mentalist well there's a guy that i met at this event there's a guy who does what i do mm -hmm. um teaching uh, sales and we we're at the event and i noticed this guy's david lyon and uh 
I'd seen, I'd seen one of his videos. He's got a, a viral video on YouTube. It's like 3.4 million views. And mm -hmm. so I'd seen that video and uh, I was like, oh, you're this guy. We're just talking. And he's got a very different uh, point of view on success and mindset. And he's all about living in flow. And there's a lot of work yeah. in flow states where my, my point of view on it, so it's, it's, we, we differ in our opinion, but I've been thinking, you know, how creatively, how do I frame him and position him? And he's got things that I want to learn yeah. and he's got things that he wants to learn. So I said, let's just do an event together. We can learn from each other for an entire day. I'll speak, you speak. And, you know, he's going to be in flow. But it, my, my point of view is this. What allows people to be in flow, like say when you see a great dancer, yeah, learning the salsa, step, 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 step. They learn these fundamental steps and then they're able to do twirl and spin the girl and all this stuff. They get in that creativity yeah, because of the structure. So it's the masculine and feminine and all that. But we do live in a creative universe and, you know, it's that sense of flow. A lot of people just kind of, whatever, man, just chilling yeah. out. You know, it's like that, that kind of doesn't happen, but he's still successful. And, um, there is something to be said for that, that whole component of effortless flow. That's his whole thing. So totally. we'll see, but, uh, he is, you know, was down to do an event. So I said, let's just do one. So we'll do a free one and we'll offer something on the back end. I did one with my buddy, AJ Mirzad, and mm -hmm. he's teaching the marketing inside of my course right now. Um, he makes 200 K a month and I teach the sales and I've actually helped him on the sales process. And so he's been helping me on, his, on the marketing organic and some yeah. and dialing in those processes and systems specifically he coaches personal trainers, how to take their business online and get to a six figure online business, you know, doing customized, yeah. it's just like, you know, you know, these guys do. So he's got a process for that. And I was like, that's valuable stuff. So he's helped me and I helped him. And I said, let's do a, a group program together. So we got like 20 people in a room sold like 10 of them for 4k each. So nice. we made you know, essentially 40 K in a day, not bad. And then for 12 weeks, he teaches one week, I teach the next week. So it's like six, you know, a couple yeah. hours every other week for a few months for that money. Not bad. It works out to like about three K an hour for yeah. if you try to, but I, I always, my trainings are supposed to be an hour and I typically go about three hours because I go deep and I role play with people and, you know, it's like my outcome is to make sure people get it. And I want to be a better coach than anybody out there. So I, I like being in the fire, standing in the fire with people and working through their, their yeah. shit um, and digging in. And, you know, I'm definitely not able to get a result and turn around everybody. Um, and so I will sit back and process like, what is it? And I was saying like for the sales stuff, mm -hmm. uh, my sales process is lethal and I'm so good and I can teach it really well now too. I mean, I've got the most high ticket sales in the business essentially. So I've, I've got the practice, but being duplicatable, getting, making sure other people get it. That's been my last year. Like all my downtime, I've been sitting really thinking through that, creating the process, breaking down the types of questions that control people's focus and make them feel things. And like the, the mental frameworks internally, externally, oh. what it looks like, but outside of that, there's the, you know, the conversion piece of the sales piece what leads into that is the marketing piece yeah. and the delivery piece. And so these pieces of the business bucket, then I'm, then I'm realizing there's also mindset. And most people don't understand what a business is. A business is a system that provides value. And for myself, like most people call themselves entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Most people are not. Only a small percentage of the population are entrepreneurs. A successful business has three main types. Entrepreneur, who by definition is does a lot with risk. Like they are very risk averse um, and they're unemotionally attached to the business. They're investing in stuff like that. They're an entrepreneur. Yeah. Then there's the artist. Like I'm an artist, Tony Robbins, an artist, a basketball player, an artist, you know, uh, a musician, an artist, you know, essentially an artist, they're a creator. And then they have a manager leader, somebody that tells them what to do. The CEO, like you do this systems, process, KPIs, manager, leader, artist, entrepreneur. All these entrepreneurs are, uh, most of them are artists also. They're creative types and they don't know how to run a business. They don't know how to, they don't know how to lead um, or they're too emotionally attached to the business. Some of them are, but you know, like Gary Vaynerchuk is, a, is an entrepreneur, even yeah. though he is, he's also an artist because he's creating everything, but he doesn't give a fuck how it looks or how he sounds or everything. He's, he's really about uh, the entrepreneurial journal, journey and you can, you can hear it. Um, for me, I'm an artist though. And so 
my my goal is soon. I'm looking for like a CEO type, somebody that's that's run a seven figure business. Um, and I've I've talked to a few people, but nobody the right fit yet. But looking for somebody to basically just tell me what to do. Um, you know, I need a manager as well because I'm all over the place. But we're we're dialing it in for me. But I'm helping other people. Initially, you have to be all three. Yeah. Yes. Of those skills. So, you know, what is a business? So I'm, I'm, my, my course has gone from just sales and influence and persuasion to marketing and marketing, just the marketing and sales. If somebody can dial in that, they're pretty good. And the relationship between the two is, is profound. Uh, like if you think of the game of golf, yeah, you have the ball on the tee and you hit it and then there's the, the cup. So hitting off the tee is the marketing, putting it in the cup is the sales. So good marketing gets the ball right next to the cup mm-hmm. and then sales just taps it in. You hop on a quick call, they're already sold. They're like, man, I'm so excited to talk to you. I read you know, your thing. I watched your, what's oh my God, I, I've been following you. And then you just tap it in the sale. If you have shitty marketing or no marketing, like a, an app, like, so basically like we were just talking about, yeah. Uh, a Facebook ad to a phone call. Yeah. They don't know you. They don't like you. They don't trust you. You better. It's like doing a 300 foot putt. It's a hard. Yeah. Putt. So your sales process will be really good if you have good marketing and good sales. So for me, I've only had good sales, no good marketing. So I'm doing more podcasts like this and things like that. But the marketing, getting getting things out there more, I've done no marketing. So the marketing, once I get that good, I'm just going to be tapping it in all day. Yeah. Tapping that ass. Tapping that ball. Tapping that ball. <laughs> Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's the process. And so we're, we're expanding a bit of it where at least people can become uh, competent in those other areas. But the biggest thing that I see is, is mindset issues, people's certainty. Totally. So does that mean you're going to go more public with it and less one-on-one coaching uh, in the near future? Yeah, I'm going to do, I'm going to take on uh, just another handful of one-on-one clients. Um, and I'm, I'm just, cause I, I think it's good to do those. Yeah. Um, and I like it, but, uh, but yeah, just this one, you know, you need to have as a marketer, you know, of a personal brand, you need to have one clear offer, one clear avatar mm-hmm. and one clear messaging. Like I help this person so that they can this and the messaging always speaking to their goals, their aspirations, their pains and their frustrations and their fears, you know, always speaking to those things in your messaging, talking to that one avatar. So the messaging process has got to be dialed in, systematic of how you do what you do, the benefits, the, you know, what that means to people emotionally, like clearly hitting that. And so I understand it, but I do very little of it just because I don't consider myself a marketer. Um, yeah. you know, I, I will need to outsource most of this because like most of the people that are out there in the industry today, they're not actually good at helping people. They're, they're just really good at talking about how they help people. Yes. And so I've just been helping people for the past decade where I've not been uh, talking about it at all um, and just meeting people face to face. So as soon as I get these pieces uh, dialed in, it's going to be pretty good. Totally. You're like a behind the scenes super connector. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, it's just, you know, I'm just kind of here and chilling out and traveling and, you know, I even changed my last name because I would, I didn't really want people to find me. Uh, My last name, my last name is Will Hyde and I was kind of hiding behind Tony, Will Hyde. And I'd always wanted to change it to wild. So I, not change it legally, but it's Eli Wild everywhere and Wild Influence. And this whole aspect of Wild Influence is having people, you know, not reading from scripts, mm-hmm. not using other people's words. Because then when you learn other people's words, you put your faith in your words and it's not authentically you. So to be wildly authentic, to be wildly influential by being yourself, that's mm-hmm. the whole thing. Just like Stuart Wilde or Oscar Wilde, some of these content creators who are really out there. Um, just that whole aspect. So it's that's kind of my my understanding and where I come from with this, with this brand is, is just that. Man, that is awesome. So uh, we talked about pattern recognition. Are there any other higher leverage skill, higher leverage skills that you think really helped get you where you are? You have language, you have pattern recognition, modeling, anything that is either an abstract concept or it could be something like learning to learn or learning to breathe better because it has such a play in just about everything you do. I'd say cold showers. Cold showers. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, cold showers, man, it's amazing. I took one just a little while ago. It just really puts you in that state, which, you know, the, the, the broader picture of what that looks like 
is understanding human emotion mm. in order to affect somebody else's human emotion in business and sales or whatever. It's, it's a transference of emotion, which doesn't mean be hypey and all pumped up, but the certainty, the feeling, feeling good about ourselves, our product, whatever comes from those patterns around physiology. You know, when you feel good, when you're moving in your body, you feel good. That affects the way you feel. Physiology affects feeling patterns of focus. So maybe having systematic habitual questions you ask yourself every day or ask your clients. Yeah. And so asking yourself like people like, why am I doing this? Does it even matter? Those questions will produce a state that will lead to a lack of action. It is like, if you ask your questions about what this means, what can I do with this? What's the first thing I'm going to buy? Who can I really help? How can I serve this person? What, you know, what does life, what, what adventure awaits me? These questions put you in a different state. So focus equals feeling. And focus is determined by the quality of questions that we ask ourselves. Mm-hmm. Quality questions, quality life. And Einstein said it best. He said, you know, the, the solution, the, your ability to, some, I'm going to butcher this quote, but it's, it's something along the lines of your ability to find the solution comes from your ability to ask the right question. Totally. So the reason that people aren't finding the solutions that they want is because they're not asking the right questions. And so we need to ask ourselves the right questions about what's possible, about what we're excited about, what we're grateful for, we ask ourselves questions. Or, you know, when I've had to do this, I've had, whenever I have a, a coach, they ask me questions and the response that you want to get, especially in a coaching context or in an enrollment context or, a, you know, in a consulting context, yeah. you don't want people having an excited agreement. Like, oh my God, I agree hundred percent. The question, the response I like having people have is when I ask them the question, they say, wow, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. Whoa. That aha moment. Yeah. It's like, wow, you know, like where else is that showing up or what would that mean to you? Or, you know, and so like, man, it's a good question. And so now they're focused on something that they couldn't focus on themselves. And now the conversation is valuable. So I want to be valuable to myself by asking myself systematic, strategic, consistent questions that put me in a feeling state. So focus, physiology, and then the pattern of language and meaning. Yeah. Nothing has any meaning except the meaning that we give it. So making everything mean something and using specific language that affects me emotionally to be in a positive state. And so feeling, so cold shower is affecting my physiology. You know, yeah. I make, yeah. also like I, if I ask myself the question, if I know that I'm about to take a cold shower and I ask myself, so like, well, I don't have to do it this time. But what <laughs> once I know that question is not good. Uh, and what do I make it mean? Uh, you know, it doesn't, it's not really that good for me. It's not really, you know, if I make it mean nothing and then I'm not going to have that juicy state. And I love the, the quote from the Navy SEALs, do today what others won't so you can have tomorrow. Or what is it? Like, do yeah. today what others won't so you, can, so you can do tomorrow what others can't. Yes. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, and so true. And so I think we have to have that consistent focus, the vision, mission, purpose for our life and to know that it's going to affect other people to condition that with our questions and meanings and physiology to produce a state in ourselves that transfers into other people into companies and brands and ideally the world you know that's the people that have had the biggest influence in the world the gandhis and mother Teresa's and all that they affected the emotions of a lot of people based on not what they said or what they did based on who they were being yeah you know being comes from conditioning totally now, and, and values, clarity of our values and conditioning that through repetition and intensity of our values and owning it. So you touched on questions. This is something I always ask as well is, are you currently questioning any, are you currently questioning anything? So it can be the way that the world works, energy, life, whatever it is. These are more big, broader topics, but it could be how politics work, how, you know, something that you're currently questioning that you've uh, been thinking about a lot. You know, I just, I just finished like a PDF that's going to be my lead magnet. And so I'm just, I'm questioning the process of questions. Yes. So if quality questions lead to quality focus, quality life, um, and then in the sales context, the influence context, the question is, how do I not only ask better questions, but teach other people better questions? And so we just, I broke, I gave examples in this PDF, but there's connecting questions. Yeah. Like so if somebody, like I meet, you know, or somebody's answered a, a, like an, like an ad and I can teach them how to make more money 
through their sales process or asking better questions, the first question I ask is, uh, have you found a way to increase your sales yet or are you still looking? And what do you think they say? They're still looking. And they tell me that, but more importantly, who are they telling? Themselves. They're telling themselves. Yeah. So that's called a quality question. And then I ask uh, background questions. What are you using now? How long? What got you started? Problem awareness questions. Um, you know, what do you like about it? What else do you like about it? Well, it sounds like everything is great, but I mean, what would you change if you could? I mean, it's, it sounds like, you know, it could be better, you know, if it's going pretty good, is it possible that it could be better? If so, what would you change if you could? They're like, well, we'd change this. It's too expensive. It's causing some stress. Stress, how do you mean by stress? Clarifying question. Um, you know, how long have you wanted to do that? How long has that been an issue? When did you notice that that wasn't the way you really wanted it? So now I'm probing and clarifying. Those are probing questions and clarifying questions. Um, then there's present problem questions. And then there's goal vision-based questions. There's solution-based questions. I might say, um, if you were to find an influencer sales type process or a mentor who could easily put an extra 10 to $20,000 in your pocket a month, when would you possibly want to start something like that? Mm. And so I'm not saying the can, but I said, so it's if you were, when would you, you know, would you possibly? So it's very non-assumptive, which is taught in sales. And so, that's a solution based questions. And there's gap creating questions, qualifying questions, quantifying questions, like scale of one to 10. You know, how much of your potential do you feel like you're leaving on the table? Scale of one to 10, how important is it for you to achieve your financial goals this year? What, is, what does that mean to you? How so? What's the first thing you would do with that money? Clarifying questions, uh, challenging questions, permission based questions, transition questions consequence questions, probing questions, commitment questions. So I've broken down the process to different types of questions and we systematically look at somebody's process and where they can ask more effective questions and go deeper based on those answers and take the client into an emotional place that gets them to produce an outcome because people do things for an emotional reason. So they need a logical and emotional triggers within themselves. So I need to be able to, to extract what they value mm -hmm. through questions, their six human needs, they're driving force. I'm hitting all these targets. And I know that actions, so at the end of your sales call, you might want somebody to take an action or your copy or whatever. So if you're, you know, you guys are writing copy and you have some action, some call to action, you know that actions are preceded by thoughts and feelings. So my target isn't always getting them to take an action. My target is the emotion and the thought that will produce the action. And I'll say, have you thought about this? You know, do you, you know, do you feel like that's costing you money? Do you mm -hmm. feel like that's costing you money? How long has that been going on? Where do you think that's affecting you the most? Or you said it's causing you some stress. How so? Mm. What is, when you said that, what did you mean by that exactly? So going deep. And yeah. so their feelings and their thoughts are going to lead to actions. And so I can hear in their voice once I'm, I got a few of these hooks yeah. about what I'm teaching they're thinking, wow, you know, even, even me in explaining this right now, I'm using it because people are thinking mm -hmm. think like, wow, I've never thought of it that way. Well, if I had something like that, I probably could make an extra 10 or 20 K in my business. So it's strategic. I mean, so I, even when I teach it, I'm creating the outcome that I want. Totally. Wow. Yeah. So that is questioning questions. And I love that. Um, questions and, and teaching a duplicatable process. The outcome is to teach a duplicatable, duplicatable process that allows people to act more, more effective questions that lead to results, but also provide a structure for the communicator and for the recipient, the client, to feel more heard, to feel more understood. And one another one of the beautiful things about questions is it takes the pressure off you because you don't feel the need to perform mm -hmm. because you're asking questions and the client's doing all the talking. And so it's kind of like hot potato. Like, oh, let me ask you this. And they're talking and ask another question as opposed to show and tell and yeah. trying to have a perfect presentation. And sales don't work that way anymore. No, I don't think they really ever have, but it's more of now we're understanding more human psychology, how people function and like actually honestly helping people versus yeah. here's a cool little pretty new thing that I saw. Yeah. Um, but awesome, Eli. Uh, where can people find you? Um, definitely going to look forward to your new program or when you come out with all the more public facing stuff, but 
at this point? Where can people find you? I enrolled, I enrolled somebody into the program right before this call. Um, and so it'll be the next 12 weeks and we'll have a lot of people going in, into it, but uh, we're starting to systematize the marketing. So people will see my face a lot more, but people find me like on Facebook, my website, and there's like a free checklist of like influencer principles. Um, if oh. people sign up for the list and it, it should come out, we're just, we're just going to set all that stuff up now. Um, but it's wild influence, W I L D E like Oscar Wilde. Awesome. Writer. Have you read that book? Uh, I have not read his book. I have certainly sure read. Sure. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. But I I refer to a lot of his quotes because he yeah. has one of the best quotes. Legend. So wildinfluence.com, and people can contact me there. There's a contact page. Um, if you have curious curious about my programs or anything, you can book a call with me. Um, but yeah, that's basically it right now. And then uh, and then Facebook. Awesome. Awesome. We're man. Do a whole LinkedIn thing soon as well. Yeah. LinkedIn. I mean, it's another good platform. It is. Yeah. It's, it's the next Facebook I'm understanding. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting, but yeah. this is definitely one that I'm going to listen to again because you dropped a lot of nuggets. So a lot of knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. I hope there's knowledge here. Awesome, man. So thank you so much. Um, guys, make sure to follow him on wild influence and, uh, yeah, we'll stay in touch. Awesome. Cool, brother. Peace.